Welcome back to the afternoon session of the day two of the Living Longer Journalism Fellowship for the National Press Foundation. We're here at AARP headquarters, and we're about to move into some territory that I think many of us as journalists feel that we know enough about, and yet we're anxious about not knowing enough about retirement and social security issues for not only our readers or viewers, but also for our own lives. So as I mentioned on Sunday, when we thought about who were the best people to come and present information to you, uh, I think we've, we've done a fine job of finding some of the best speakers in the country, really, who can help us understand some of these issues. So at, you'll first hear from David John, He's a senior strategic policy advisor at AARP and also a senior fellow of economic studies at the Brookings Institution. So David, please come join us and, and get us started on this conversation. We have a horribly complex confusing an accidental retirement savings system, or retirement system. Essentially, unlike most other countries, it seems to get louder as I move to the left, uh, unlike most other countries which have actually planned their retirement system, ours is a series of accidents. The key accident was a uh, tax attorney who found uh, section 401k of the tax code and converted it into something that it was never intended to be. Now, going forward then, because this is a largely accidental system, or ad hoc system, if you will, uh, we have some problems. And that's what I'm going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to do, I've got a bunch of information. I always overdo it with information. Uh, luckily, I think you're going to get copies of these slides. Uh, and the, the goal is to get questions, so if I don't cover something properly uh, the first time we can go from there. All right, assuming here's what we need to do. First off, we have about half the, re the workforce, the private sector workforce, who has a retirement savings plan. If you don't have a retirement savings plan and use payroll deduction, you don't save for retirement, period, unless you're upper income. And in that case, you don't really have to worry anyway. So first question is, who has access <clears throat> and how do we make savings easy? The concept of just, well, we'll educate people and they'll make the right decision doesn't work. Uh, Einstein supposedly said something to the effect that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We have the results, they're not good, so we need to do something else. Next, the undiscussed problem is how do you preserve them? Most journalists, I know when I started out uh, with the Grand Cedartown, Georgia standard, right out of journalism school, uh, this was a paper where the, the nameplate said that it was the light of the world, which actually referred to the burning quality of the paper, but that's <laughs> something else. So, but if you move from job to job, Moving your retirement savings, even if you have a 401k, is difficult. I can testify to that from personal experience. It especially affects lower income, people of color, women, etc., who are more likely to be cashed out or to lose their accounts because companies change, they go out of business, the managers merge into different things. And we have literally thousands <clears throat> who have lost millions and billions that way that they could have been using for their retirement savings. Uh, then there's the hardest job of all, and this is an international question that we are seeing across the globe in any type of retirement savings system, which is you retire you've got what looks like more money than you ever had in your life. And they say to you, uh, well, you're the only one who knows how to figure this out. 
And there are all kinds of wonderful people who will send you messages on the internet with the latest and greatest uh, way to use your savings, none of which benefit you. Uh, but you have to figure out how to use it. And that's problem number three. And last but not least, we have a question of emergency savings. Because the simple fact of life is that you will find the car is going to blow up at the wrong time, hopefully just the tire. The roof is going to leak. Somebody's going to break their leg or something along that line. And that can seriously destabilize family finances. So how do we fit it so that you can deal with those finances and continue to build up retirement security? All of that's true. And emergency savings is just important when you retire because the roof will leak regardless of what your age is or anything along that line. So some specifics here. First, building the retirement savings. This is a new fact sheet that we just had the world expert in uh, doing retirement data do for us, a guy named John Sablehaus, who was retired from the Federal Reserve Board. These are people who don't have a plan. These are private sector workers. Uh, public sector workers are a different uh, level of security. So who do we have here? 48%, 57 million, rounding it off, uh, people don't have a way to save for retirement using payroll deduction. This is a mess. Now, who is most affected here? Well, if you're young, if you're people of color, if you have lower education level, these two are roughly the same, females slightly more disadvantaged. The smaller the business, the less likely you are to have a retirement savings plan and the lower your income. Now what that means is that the people who need this the most to supplement their social security benefits are the ones who have it the least. Here we have some statistics. This is from an AARP poll that was done last fall of voters. 96% of people who have a retirement plan say that retirement plan uh, was a big help in building your retirement savings. Among those who didn't have one, 91% are likely to save. And this is, these are numbers that we have seen consistently through uh, time. So what has been one step that we can do to start this? And the answer is state facilitated retirement savings plans. Uh, the automatic IRA happens to be one of the mechanisms here. These are numbers, and they come from uh, Messina Associates. Uh, the Georgetown Center for Retirement Initiatives has a similar table there that you can use. And we have, as of yesterday, five operating state facilitated programs. Uh, California, Oregon, Illinois, Connecticut, and as of yesterday, Maryland. These are the ones that have been operating for a while. Connecticut just started earlier this year. This is a very simple, easy to understand, easy to use retirement savings system specifically developed to uh, meet the needs of small business employees and their employees. You don't have to have an MBA or any sort of financial training to operate one of these. And if you are an employer, it's frightfully easy. All you have to do is sign up your workers and let them know that they are going to be automatically enrolled. Automatic enrollment means that you are part of the plan, contributing X percentage of your income into a particular retirement savings vehicle, unless you say no, which you have the right to do at any time, or unless you decide you want to save more or less or move it to a different retirement thing. If you're familiar with a 529 college savings plan, 
This is basically the retirement equivalent. And what we see so far in the three operating states that have been operating the longest is we've got half a billion dollars there and uh, over half a million people saving. One other advantage, which I'll get to at the end here, is that this is saving into a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA, it's payroll deduction, says that you can pull out your savings, not any investment gains, at any time without penalty. So if you are a lower income worker or upper income worker with one of these and the car tire blows, and we literally have had experiences where people lost their jobs because they couldn't get to work because they didn't have the ability to fix the tire immediately. You can pull money out of your savings, fix it, and go to work. So this also serves as an emergency savings vehicle. As I say, well, there we are. I've lost my slide. Uh, the automatic IRA basically helps employees save their own money. And that's the key factor here. People are building their own retirement security. And a key factor for employers is that they're not paying a fee for this. And here's a little bit more. One other factor, which is a very important one, and this is data that uh, the Pew Charitable Trust and John Scott has done down the street, is that it looks like employers, when they have an exposure to the state facilitated programs, some of them will decide, well, you know, I'm doing a little bit better and I want to share some of that with my employees, or I want to attract a better class of employees and keep the good ones that I've got. And therefore, I'm going to do something bigger and better. And we have a significant number who are moving into private sector plans. So instead of crowding out the private sector, and the private sector actually operates the auto IRAs, the state hires private providers to do this. Uh, they are actually moving into and starting 401ks and uh, 403bs or pooled employer plans or the various and sundry other mechanisms there. Small business experience, and I'm actually not going to go through this. This is something you can read later. Basically, it's positive. And this is particularly discusses, discussions and meetings with employers. The employers, once they get some experience with this, like this. And that is why we are starting to be able to see for the first time ever that the needle is starting to move so that we have more and more people who are being able to build their retirement security. Now let's talk about quickly the preserving retirement savings. Job cash outs are a problem. The law allows that if you have a savings balance under $5,000, the employer can decide to basically hand, or excuse me, it's under $1,000, can decide to hand you a check. And very often we see that HR professionals will urge people to take the check simply because it's the easiest thing for them to do. There's another level where they can roll your money automatically into a, an IRA and send you a message saying, by the way, we don't have your retirement savings anymore. It's uh, now in an IRA. And as you can see, 60 to $105 billion a year. Four and a half to 6.4 million participants are cashed out every year. Leakage reduces retirement balances by 31% at age 60, and that's according to the US Treasury and the Joint Tax Committee. Small accounts, and this is a key one, if your money is rolled into a, uh, a rollover IRA, first off, it's not allowed by Treasury regulations to be invested. So basically, it's put in the equivalent of a bank account so it doesn't grow. So rather than having $2,500 
grow by age 65 into 100,000 or something along that line, it stays at about $2,500 or so. And these are commonly lost. Small rollover IRAs are 10 times more likely to not be claimed by age 72. And if it's not claimed by age 72, frankly, the odds are it'll never be claimed. The companies get to keep that money, and they put it in a special reserve account. Oops. Hmm. All right. The, there are a variety of things that we can do. Wow. Much more uh, sensitive than I thought. There are a variety of things. I'm not going to go through these, but this is a problem that can be solved fairly easily using changes in business practices and changes in regulatory things. We don't need necessarily to have Congress do something major there. Another thing that we can do is to have actually a pensions dashboard. These exist in several countries, Scandinavia, the UK is putting one in. Uh, we've talked about it. This is an air, a way that you can find lost accounts. It allows you to recover them, combine them in some cases, uh, et cetera. But the saver has to go to it. It's not something that is going to go otherwise. Another one, and this is something that's being implemented in Australia, is uh, where you have an account and it goes with you. So when you sign up for a new job, you provide instead of two pieces of information, your social security account and your bank account for a direct deposit, you also provide the number for your retirement account. And that way you don't lose any money. It just goes with you and it continues to build up the way it should. Now, using retirement savings. This is the biggest problem that we face. It's the one that people are trying to figure out. Most Americans, 73% in this particular one, say, I don't have the financial skills to manage my money in retirement. 79% are certain that their neighbors don't either, which goes to our usual thing that I know what I'm doing, but my neighbor is an idiot, which we see in a, a wide variety of areas here and there. This process just became much harder, too, because of inflation. In the past, the theory was that you took Social Security, and Social Security is even more important than it used to be because it's inflation indexed. Every January 1st, your payment goes up based on inflation from third quarter to third quarter. It's one of the very few things that are inflation index. It used to be in the previous inflation, you could get an annuity that was inflation indexed. Those are few and far to, uh, behind or to find these days. And they are more expensive and more complex if you do it. And the complexity doesn't necessarily benefit the saver. It does, however, do wonderful things for the company's bottom line. So uh, dealing with inflation is making all of this much harder. Uh, the advice, the best advice that anyone can have is delay taking your Social Security as long as you can, you know, based on your health and other circumstances, because it continues to go up until you reach age 70. Uh, and once that amount is set, it's inflation indexed from that point on. This is what should be the base that you build your retirement security on. Now, last but not least, emergency savings. We know from research that having and using em emergency savings does fine things to the household balance sheet because Rather than having something that puts you into debt or where you have to buy something or borrow from your neighbors or your family or put something on an expensive credit card, if you have emergency savings, it allows you to deal with the issue 
and continue with your household uh, finance as it was or close to where it was. You also want to rebuild that. We found that roughly seven in 10 individuals want a, an emergency account. And this is not your normal, this is not my savings account that I'm going to use to pay for my vacation. This is the money that I have set aside for when the unexpected happens. But it's hard to enroll. You have to make under US law and regulations right now, in virtually every case, you have to decide, I'm going to sign up for this emergency savings account separately, and I'm going to figure out how much I'm going to put in and things along that line. And the bottom line on all financial transactions are, is that the longer the period, literally in minutes, between the time somebody makes a decision, yes, I want to do this, and they actually do it, the number of people who actually get it done declines rather precipitously. So what we have proposed is automatic enrollment, the same mechanism that we use for retirement now. And there was an experiment that was just done in the United Kingdom by NEST, the National Employment Savings Trust, which is the default provider for the UK's automatic enrollment system. And the, per, the take up of an emergency savings account at their target companies, which were companies that were for the most part consumer companies with low income employees, went from about 2% to about 52%. And the amount that they saved on average went from about 30 pounds to about 130 pounds. Now, both of those are low numbers, but keep in mind here, these were low-income individual savings. So the amount that they saved over a, roughly a six-month period actually isn't that low given the population that you're dealing with. So if we combine, if we can start to fix the four areas that I've mentioned here, we can then start to have a retirement savings system or a retirement income system that supplements Social Security that actually works for people. That it does something other than the person in the corner office who does really well anyway. That we can actually start to take care of some of the people who need it most. But that also includes large numbers of moderate income, middle income, and even a certain number of upper income people. So this is the way these things to democratize, if you will, the retirement savings system. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sivash. Oh, questions later. <laughs> Sivash Broadpour. He is the Associate Director of Relab at the New School. And you'll also be sharing with us, I think, some uh, information about new chart books from the Schwartz Center for um, Economic Policy Analysis. So we look forward to hearing from you. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. And I'm glad to go second, because David made it much easier for me by covering <laughs> many of the topics that I would have to talk about here. Uh, so uh, as Rachel said, I am going to uh, talk about retirement security and older workers and how issues of re retirement insecurity and work at older ages are linked together. And uh, we are working on a chart book, uh, joint chart book between uh, Short Center and Economic Policy Institute, EPI, uh, which is funded by uh, RRF, uh, Foundation for Aging, on Aging. And, uh, Hopefully, it will be out in a couple of months. So uh, many of the charts that I'm using will show up in that chart book. So let's start by uh, framing the issue of uh, retirement insecurity and how we uh, uh, at the Schwartz Center uh, for Economic Policy Analysis look at it mostly. So uh, the main important uh, issue here is that retirement uh, insecurity is a systemic issue. And that's how we look at it. We look at how we can fix a broken system that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, 
uh, rather than looking at how we can deal with uh, individual behaviors uh, and what people are doing wrong. Because if somebody is doing something wrong, it's also likely that the system exposed them to uh, making bad decisions and gave them the opportunity to make that de decisions and then give them enough information. So that's what the system is supposed to do. We have a retirement system. Most countries have retirement systems because we need it, because people wouldn't be able to do it on their own. So we look at it as a systemic issue. And because it's a systemic issue, everybody in the system is at risk to some extent. So in the end, when some, some people do fine, end up doing well, and some people are not, it's not because people who are doing well have done everything correctly, and people who are not doing well have made a mistake. It's not an issue that we did fine, what did you do wrong? It's an issue of risk. So some people face more challenges, some people face fewer challenges, or no challenges. And this is a big problem, because when we talk to people, uh, I was talking on a radio show in uh, Texas Public Radio, and people would call and like, oh, you talk about the system, but what about personal responsibility? And we are not saying there is no personal responsibility, but you should understand it's a matter of risk, and we are trying to deal with the risk before anything else. And this risk is not equally distributed, of course. Retirement security is something that you accumulate over your lifetime, just like retirement savings. And what you experience throughout your life affects that. So it's not just one special moment. What you experience in the labor force, in education, in your uh, household, it all affects your retirement security. So in the end, it's more unequal. Retirement saving is more unequal. That housing wealth is more unequal than wealth in general. It's more unequal than income because it's, it shows the compounding effects of all these inequalities. It's not something that only affects uh, retirees because when retirees are not prepared for retirement, their children provide them with financial aid and care. When they can, they support, they support them financially. Where when they cannot, they have to provide care, which often like, uh, takes them away from uh, their jobs. So they have to quit their jobs to take care of their aging parents. So it doesn't only affect retirees. It's, it has uh, consequences for younger generations also. And when I say younger, I don't mean like 20 year olds. Many people who are caregivers are like 55 to 64, so they are older workers themselves already. And another issue that I'm going to focus mostly today is that it's not just a matter of standards of, standards of living in retirement. It's also affecting the job quality and wage growth of people who are still working. Because if you don't have retirement security, if you feel like, oh, if I lose my job, if my boss doesn't like me, I'm screwed because I don't have anything for retirement. That prevents you uh, from bargaining for better wages. That prevents you from asking for better working condition. And you cannot go look for a different job. You stay in bad jobs, which are expanding among older workers, unfortunately. And keep in mind, I'm not saying that the system is getting worse or uh, we are not doing any better than we have been doing like 40 years ago. Because some people may tell you that, oh, look, retirement savings have increased, like coverage have increased by 2 percentage point, 3 percentage point. The problem is that we haven't had any significant progress. System has regressed in some uh, issues. It ha there has been some progress in some other fields. The biggest problem is that we, didn't ha we haven't had any like, breakthrough in the past 40 years, I would say. And at the same time, we have a growing aging population. So the scale of the problem have in has increased significantly. So if we had the same poverty rate as 40 years ago, as 20 years ago, now we have like t twice the population of uh, older uh, workers and retirees as we had compared to what we had 20 years ago. In sh uh, there, a much larger share of population. So 
even if the poverty rate among this population is the same, the number of people who live in poverty at older ages have uh, doubled. So what are the issues, the main issues with the retirement system? We have already covered most of these. Uh, lack of access to workplace retirement plans because we left the system to employers, the same as healthcare. So it's up to employer if they want to offer a plan or not. It leaves half of employees uh, without access, but also a large share of uh, self-employed gig workers don't have access to any plans because they don't have an employer. And uh, that is a huge issue. Self-employed people are a very diverse group of people. You have lawyers and doctors and everyone who have their own small businesses, but you also have a lot of gig workers in uh, working in minimum pay in paying jobs. So uh, I think the access to retirement plan among these uh, workers is somewhere around like 10 to 15 percent. So it's much worse than uh, people who actually have a, uh, have a job and have an employer who can offer them these plans. Uh, early withdrawals are a problem. Uh, people, low earners are much exposed to, uh, to risks of job loss and poor health and everything else, uh, to economic shocks. And when they face these shocks, they don't have emergency savings or access to credit. They can't get a loan easily. So they are mostly at risk of early, with early withdrawals. Uh, a huge issue that uh, we are dealing with is regressive retirement tax ex expenditures. So our retirement system, as David mentioned, is a creation of the tax code. Other than Social Security, we just have the 401ks and a couple of other tax provisions that create our retirement system uh, through giving uh, uh, tax breaks for retirement uh, savings. But it doesn't work for everyone. It mostly works for people who are paying a lot of taxes. So people who don't have access uh, to retirement, saving, retirement plans at work uh, or have or are paying very little taxes to begin with, they don't really benefit from this system. There is nothing in for them. So uh, Tax Policy Center uh, did some analysis of who is benefiting from tax expenditure. And for uh, the lowest decile of earners, they're actually paying more taxes because they are contributing to the plans and then withdraw, withdraw early because they face uh, emergencies and they have to withdraw money and they pay penalties. So low earners are actually paying more taxes because of the retirement savings. High earners are getting uh, the lion's share. And yeah, of course, they're exposed to bad advice and high fees and uh, lump sum withdrawals, as uh, David says, is a huge issue. So this is uh, where the system is leaving us. It's hard to read. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I wish I could uh, use larger funds here. But the yellow bars uh, are uh, the share of income, the share of household income that comes from Social Security. So for most Americans, for most American households, a huge part of income after age 65 comes from Social Security. So what the retirement system is supposed to do, supplementing this, is not really happening for many households. This, the retirement income is the uh, orange part. So around 20 to 27 percent for uh, the middle quintile and uh, the fourth quintile, but not that much. As you can see, earnings, which is the light blue one at the bottom, is also not a big deal. So you hear a lot about people working longer to supplement their uh, retirement savings and retirement income. It's not really happening or it's happening, but they're not getting paid much. So it has very uh, small effect. Uh, for, again, for the bottom 50%, uh, I would say, social security is the main sort of, source of income. Uh, and that's something we should do something about, either by expanding social security or by supplementing it. So why is it that, uh, Working longer is not really a thing. Why is it that people cannot uh, earn more now that they are living longer uh, to supplement their social security and their retirement income? It's because jobs for older workers are not really what we typically think of. They are difficult jobs. They're physically demanding jobs, many of them. 
and that contributes to workers uh, dropping out of the labor force. So for Hispanic women ages 65 and over, 44% of them are working in jobs that are physically demanding. Home health care aides are uh, among those people, like they have to lift the uh, people who are taken care of. There is a lot of uh, physical work there, stooping and bending, working in warehouses. And uh, I suppose you have heard about this in the uh, previous panels, maybe. But uh, it's a big problem. It's the main problem for people losing their jobs or stop working uh, while they still need to work which leads us to the issue of uh, involuntary retirement. Around half of people who go from working to retirement, among half of them, do that after experiencing something out of their control, like poor health, losing their jobs, or having to take care of a family member. So you're working, you're not planning to retire, because pr probably because you're not ready for it, but then you face a challenge, like you lose your job, and for older workers, it's not easy to find another one because there's age discrimination. If they find another job, they won't uh, get paid the same way because the new employer doesn't, ha doesn't necessarily appreciate all the experience they have and the skills they have. It's a separate job, new industry maybe. So it's very difficult for them. They typically face much longer uh, periods of unemployment and many of them give up. So more than half of people <laughs> ages 55 to 64, and above 40% of those 65 and over experience this uh, involuntary retirement. So they go into retirement because they face things that uh, they didn't expect to. And the ratio is lower for older, uh, older workers for 65 and over because more people volunteer retire, uh, voluntarily retire, not because uh, they're less likely to face these risks, this sort of risk. As a result, you see, uh, historically, we have had some improvement in labor force participation of uh, older workers. But since tw 2010, it's not really happening. There is a slight uh, increase. And this is pre-pandemic. Like, let's not talk about the pandemic and uh, all it has done uh, to older workers. But prior to pandemic, for the past 10 years, there hasn't been that much improvement. Uh, and we expect a lot to see a lot more, but we are not seeing anything. If you look historically, other than the large increase in uh, women's participation rate, for men, there hasn't been much change. And again, it's not because there is no supply. It's because it's really hard to work at older ages when employers are not friendly to you, when the labor market is not ready for you, even when you need the income. It leaves older American households in a bad situation. They are going, they're approaching retirement with less savings, more student debt, more mortgage debt. They are fragile and they are vulnerable. And this is data before the pandemic. So we went to the pandemic at the point that low earners especially had more debt and more uh, financial obligations than ever. And they didn't have much more savings. It leaves older workers vulnerable and insecure. Almost 70% of them think if they lose their job that they have right now, they cannot find anything similar or better. So they know if they lose their job, their situation just, will just get worse. It's much worse for uh, older workers than younger people. And it's worse whenever you have a recession, when there is uh, higher unemployment, they feel even worse. So you can imagine how bad it is now. I don't have the data for the pandemic, but based on what happened uh, during the Great Recession, uh, you, can, uh, you can guess what happened during the pandemic to these people. So what happens when you don't feel secure at your job? You stop bargaining. You stop asking for improvement. And especially now that older workers have to, uh, are a much larger share of the workforce, over a quarter of workers are over 50, age 55 now. Meaning the jobs that before we didn't think of them as like 
jobs that older workers uh, were doing or should, should be doing now are uh, jobs that older workers have to take. So uh, David already talked about uh, what the states are doing uh, to improve the situation. Uh, and I, I will spend some time talking about uh, federal solutions for, uh, for the problem. So two different set of policies, policies that allow older workers to keep working if they want to, and policies that allow them to retire if they want to. So it's all about giving them options and empowering them. So for those who want to and need to retire, we need a stronger social security to support them. We can improve our retirement saving system. It will be too late for many people who are going to retire soon. So we need to do that. But social security is an immediate solution. Supporting and supplementing uh, state plans some states have su successfully implemented them. Many states are far from it. So we can have a situation similar to uh, healthcare and like allow people who, are, who live in the states that are not participate, maybe participate in a federal plan. Or uh, as David was saying, uh, we can have a federal plans similar to uh, the uh, automatic enrollment system. So all the money can go there and allow people who move between the states uh, benefit from that. And the most important part is rethinking uh, the retirement tax expenditure. So uh, right now we have savers credit for low earners. Initially, I think uh, the idea was developed during uh, Clinton administration and was supposed to be a federal plan with refundable credit for everyone, so something like a government match. But it was cut down and down and down and down. So now we have uh, some tax credit for savers if they're low, low income. But again, not that many people benefit from that because they don't have necessarily tax obligations, enough ta tax ob obligations. So we can make that refundable. By making tax credit refundable, people who are participating in estate plans or workplace plans can actually uh, boost their retirement savings significantly. We can also help older workers work if they want to. We have anti-age discrimination law. It's not strong enough. It's not enforced well. We should work on that. We can uh, help employers hire older workers. Right now, older workers, 65 and over, and many who are younger but don't have younger children, do not receive EITC. And only those who are 65 and over are enrolled in Medicare, but Medicare is not the uh, primary uh, payer for health insurance. So if Medicare is, pay is the primary uh, health insurance for them, and if they're receiving EITC, it will reduce the cost for employer to hire these workers and reduces the competition between older workers and younger ones who have lower health insurance costs and receive EITC. And any policies that makes workplace um, friendlier place for uh, older workers, such as uh, paid sick leave and time off. Everyone needs that. It's not just for older workers, but older workers may benefit more from it. Or better uh, health and safety measures. So OSHA did not change during pandemic, put many older workers at risk. But we can do better than that for older workers and for younger workers. So by making workplace a more welcoming uh, place for older workers, making it easier for employers to hire uh, older workers, and make it more difficult for them to discriminate against uh, older workers, we can help older workers remain in the labor force when they want to. Thank you so much. Uh, we will release the chart book soon. but. Uh, before that, if you have any questions regarding uh, any of these issues, you can contact SIPA or me directly. Thank you so much. As we wait for the journalists to come up with their questions, uh, okay. why don't you two please join me here? Um, tell us a little bit about the chart books and what they can expect in terms of planning to uh, perhaps 
write about them for further organizations? Well, uh, we did have a chart book before. Uh, we do have a chart book that was that came out like before the pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, the timing wasn't uh, great. And uh, EPI also has had chart books on retirement security for a long time. Uh, we, we decided to merge these two and focus more on the linkage between retirement insecurity and working at older ages, which is an issue that we, we recently started paying more attention to. Uh, because like uh, the past couple of decades, uh, people have been talking about working longer as a solution for the retirement uh, crisis or lack of retirement security. We don't think that's the solution. And uh, we do, mostly because people, many people cannot work longer. So there is huge inequalities in access to labor market and access to good jobs there. Uh, that's why we try to uh, shift the focus a little bit on working longer and how not having retirement security makes working more difficult for the workers. Very quickly, also, that we have a couple of resources that might be useful. We have new, uh, you saw our national statistics on who doesn't have a retirement plan. We also have those for all 50 states. They're brand new, just been put up, et cetera, and the District of Columbia. And we have new fact sheets on Social Security, state by state, about uh, who's covered or who's receiving benefits and things along that line. So combined with uh, the fact book here, the data is available. It's just a matter of how you choose to use it. Questions? Yeah. Hi. Just wanted to ask if Puerto Rico, being a US territory, is included in the survey? Sadly, no. That's very frustrating to us. Well, and I, I have to, to admit deal with that it. AARP has included us in other studies, so. But I'll it, just keep on asking. <laughs> please do. Uh, it, what we use is national databases. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you have to have a certain number of observations before we can draw the bright numbers there. And we don't have those for Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands. Uh, and I find that a matter of great frustration. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask is, are you not accounting for the people who might be looking for other alternatives for retirement? Like, let's say, being uh, investing in a business, reinventing themselves, either, or investing their savings in property or other things. I mean, that should be a portion of the of the people who are retiring, or am I wrong? You know, Jen Schramm, who was here yesterday, actually has a fair number of numbers on that sort of thing. We have seen a significant growth in the number of older entrepreneurs who are starting businesses and things along that line. It's still, though, a fairly small percentage of the whole. Hi, uh, Renee Cordes for Made Biz. Siavish, uh, did I pronounce that right? Siavash. 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 Okay. You mentioned that there's been uh, no breakthrough. Uh, you were talking about uh, legislation or in the system. And if in the past 40 years, do you see any glimmers of hope, if not for a breakthrough, then for, you know, so, some sign of reform, either at state or federal level? And uh, the second question um, uh, is uh, for, uh, for David about the um, automated savings programs for small businesses. So how many more states are planning to implement this? And the, are there certain, this is for small businesses and uh, any sectors in particular that are, are taking this up? Okay, so uh, there has been some progress. Like the initial idea of having 401ks as something that would supplement pensions is a great idea. Like if people had pensions and on top of that could save on their own would be a great idea. Uh, so there has been a couple of like policies such as that and or state plans that I would call progress. Some of them weren't used properly, of course, and that's a big issue. There has been, uh, unfortunately, like the increase in uh, normal retirement age in social security or full retirement age uh, is a huge problem because you can frame it also as like overall cut in social security. 
which is, uh, I think, the better way of framing it, because it doesn't matter whenever you uh, claim your social security, you are experiencing a huge drop in your uh, social security income. So there is hope, because uh, there has been a lot of work on these issues that we didn't have before. Uh, and maybe that gives us hope. Also, the demographic change, I think, uh, is giving me personally a lot of hope, because now uh, politicians are paying more attention to these issues. Like, I think even in 2016, if we approached like uh, politicians that, oh, like for presidential campaign, like this re retirement is a big issue. Why don't you talk about this? And like, nobody cares about this. But now that's not the case. Now uh, they are coming up with plans because the voter demographic has changed. So there is some hope in that sense. The demographic in Congress has also changed. We have a lot of older people there. <laughs> and there's you know, a little self-interest there. The state programs uh, typically cover all workers uh, equally. So for instance, California just passed a law and was signed uh, that expanded their coverage from companies with five or more to one or more. So basically, everyone in California and Oregon is covered. Uh, Connecticut New, uh, and um, Illinois are five and above, and that was a change. Uh, typically, these do help certain sectors more than others, the small business sector. Now, typically, a, a small law office probably had a 401k. A small uh, auto repair firm or something like that I almost certainly did not. So this is actually focused increasingly on the individuals who need this kind of support the most. After Anne, we'll come back over on the side. Um, David, I had a quick question for you. It's a little technical. You mentioned small IRAs that aren't claimed. Yes. Uh, by which I assume that means, like, you know, where the company kind of sent them off to, right? right. That though, so those, if they're not claimed, they go back to the company. Yeah, because the company is acting as the trustee for your money, and if it's unclaimed. Uh, most of the large providers actually have a level where, in theory, this is um, being held for you. You know, they're, they're still the trustee for your money there. And if you don't claim it, maybe your heirs could at some point. But it's been interesting because the state treasurers at one point suggested that they actually have this incredible lost property system, and you could put it there just as easily. And the companies uh, did not really like that idea. <laughs> so is, is there a way to like trace what companies receive a lot of that? You know, money coming back to them? Typically, uh, it would depend on the market share for the rollover IRAs. And the market share in a large number of cases would be the uh, larger uh, the, the larger providers. In other words, uh, the ones who are the investment managers or the uh, trustees. And frankly, that information should be available whether it actually is or not. And one of the big problems we face in the US is, frankly, our information system is, well, to use the word garbage. Uh, it, it doesn't have the kind of data that we see overseas that gives would tell us precisely who that is. But that should be traceable. And it may be traceable actually using some of uh, PBGCs, even though they focus on the defined benefit plans. Bill. Uh, Bill Cole with the Associated Press. A question for Siavash. Um, you had a line on one of your slides that you kind of skipped over, and I, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on it, about lump sum withdrawals and longevity risk. We see this happening with a lot of companies, and full disclosure, it's happening to me right now. I have to decide by the end of next month whether to accept a lump sum of my pension, and I'm 62. Can you just talk about the risks th there that American workers are facing? I mean, uh, David covered that mostly, that you, you withdraw your money uh, instead of receiving pension benefits. You have a lump sum. And then what are you going to do with that money? Uh, so you have the same problem that David was explaining, that there are no good annuities out there. So yeah, what, 
what most people would recommend is that people just uh, delay social claiming social security as much as they can because social security is like, the best annuity you can get, uh, the best deal you can get out there right now. I'm going to add just one or two things very quickly. One is that uh, if you take social security at 62, you're getting a reduced level, a sharply reduced level, and that locks in. So the longer you can delay, the, the better it is. But the first thing that we advise when we're doing uh, financial education and things like that is financial planner is good, but you want to ask the question, is this person operating as a fiduciary and not someone in someone else's benefit? And number two, which uh, is equally important in, in that case, is to have a budget. And that's a painful process to do, I can say from personal experience. But even just something like, uh, because I'm low tech, I had a little uh, spiral bound notebook and wrote down what I was spending. And I was kind of surprised at what I was spending money for. And it helped me to focus a little bit better on what I actually needed to do. So I was talking to one of these financial planners. And uh, he was saying that he only takes like clients that have like more than like $2 million or something like that. And he would charge them 1% of the assets per year just to put the money in some fidelity managed accounts. So not more than that. So it's a lot of money. But the truth is, if you don't understand that that's a lot of money, you are probably safer with this financial planner who will act, act as a fiduciary. Like, uh, so it's, it's a problem. It's, it's an expensive problem for many people. And uh, there is no good way of dealing with that. See, now luckily most journalists have two million with no trouble at all. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, well, Sirvash, you mentioned uh, like better health and safety requirements would help um, older workers. So I'm wondering if there's any like specific um, OSHA uh, initiatives that sh should be happening and if AA and David, if there's like AARP is you know, uh, behind any initiatives around uh, like OSHA requirements? Well, uh, the pandemic is officially over. So uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if yeah. we should be talking about that. Uh, there is a lot of good research on the intersection of uh, ADA and uh, aging. So we have good protections uh, for uh, disability but it doesn't really apply to aging in all instances. So that's a good space to explore and see like how we can exp expand the definition, of, the definition of disability or recreate the same sort of protect protection that we have for the specific types of disabilities to also make workplace uh, a better uh, environment for uh, older workers. So, it's, it's not probably the uh, best language to use because we don't want to say like aging and disability are the same thing, they're not. But uh, the, uh, the legal approach can be similar, let's put it that way. That you, ha you can have legislations. So I wouldn't go the OSHA road okay. necessarily. It was necessary for the pandemic, it didn't happen. And now like the only people who were very active in that sense were unions. And uh, they weren't very successful because uh, the first year of pandemic was basically lost to Trump uh, administration to some sense. But uh, yeah, it's too late for that. And uh, it's maybe more helpful to focus on what we can do with ADA and expanding that to cover aging. I focus on certain specific issues that I actually know, and that's not one of them. But if you talk to Emily over there, uh, she can put you in touch with the right person. We can take probably two more questions. Hi, Rebecca Knight, uh, Business Insider. My question is for Siavash. Uh, one of the things that you had put as one of the potential solutions or remedies was to strengthen the age discrimination laws. And we've been hearing uh, multiple times that it is the burden of proof is so high, and you have to demonstrate that that was the only reason in terms of hiring and firing. So I'm wondering, what specific solution you would have there to strengthen these laws? Well, that's it, basically. Like, just the Congress make, makes it clear, because this is the Supreme Court decision. So the Supreme Court decided that the, what Congress meant by not discriminating against the age 
is not similar, but what they meant by not discriminating based on uh, race or uh, other factors. And said that, OK, so we need more uh, scrutiny when it comes to age and uh, set the criteria in a way that uh, all the workers have to prove that age was the deciding factor and not one of the factors, so the factor. And it's basically impossible. Uh, so the Congress should just clarify that, that no, that's not what we meant. So we don't need anything like, uh, I mean, they can do something more uh, substantial than that. But even that would be a big step to fix things and uh, to help older workers actually uh, protect themselves. Uh, Susan Tampor at the Free Press in Detroit. I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on the emergency savings accounts. Will we see more um, action on that with uh, on the Hill with the new uh, retirement discussions? Yeah, we're actually seeing action in a variety of areas at the moment, all of them important. Uh, there are provisions in uh, the legislation that's before Congress at the moment, uh, of course, Legislation has been known to change from step A to step B uh, there. But what we're also seeing is an increasing number of employers who are recognizing the value of this and putting this in their package of employee benefits. We are also seeing parallel uh, what the, the fact that an increasing number of employees are hearing about these things and they want them. So there, it's a matter of a, a, a sweet spot, if you will, growing interest in employers, growing demand from employees. And uh, we are, this is, we actually have a poll that we did. This was in 2018, but it, there was a recent study uh, that reinforced that, that actually shows people what features someone wants in an emergency savings plan. And what, what is the most important part of an emergency savings plan to them? Because uh, one of the things that we have learned in many years of study is that if you have to educate somebody to use your uh, product or your benefit there, it probably means that the benefit hasn't been structured properly to meet their needs. And uh, this would be, tell you fairly effectively what people want and what people need. Is there any uh, recommended uh, percentage or amount for this uh, emergency expenditure fund? And in the absence of having it in the workplace as individuals, is there any recommendation on AARP behalf that we have as a, a emergency expenditure money? This is an AARP, but it is from the studies, et cetera. So I don't think we have an official position that it should be X dollars or Y dollars. If you talk to a financial planner, they're going to tell you three to six months. That's nice if you're rich. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not. Uh, but what we found in a study, and this is a Sabat and Gallagher paper that's on our website there, shows that approximately uh, 2,500 or maybe one month is about right. And that would help you meet virtually all except the most dire uh, expenses that are out there. We are out of time. But I, what I would like to uh, say is I'm happy to have found my new two financial planners. <laughs> I'm going to be OK. I, I don't know about the rest of you. But uh, I hope that this is the beginning of a, a thought process for all of you in terms of how you report on retirement, Social Security, what people need to be thinking about and considering. And I know that we can count on Siavash and David to, if we need to reach out to you oh, in the yeah, future sure. to stay in touch. And you'll let us know about when the chart books yeah, are released. So Thank let's you. take this opportunity to, to thank them for joining us today. Thank you.